Well, if you're comfortable sharing, I would love to get into details about your specific sauna protocol that you've adapted in, in your life. How often do you use the sauna? Uh, what temperature, what humidity? Um, you know, how long do you stay in there? So let's get into some of those details. And I'll, I'll preface this by saying, this is not medical advice. Anyone that is considering using the sauna, good idea to check it out with your medical professional first in case you have a health condition that may make sauna use dangerous. But um, with that said, yeah, let's hear about what, what you've uh, uh, incorporated into your life. Sure. Well, let's start with the studies um, and the data that I referred to and, and what the temperature, duration, et cetera. I talked a lot about frequency four to seven times a week, but I didn't talk much about temperature or how long people were in the sauna. So in almost all of those studies, the temperature of the sauna, um, these were these were saunas in Finland and they were 174 degrees Fahrenheit around. Um, and the humidity was between, between uh, 10 to 20% humidity, I think, something like that. And so... Um, what was very interesting to me when I was looking at the data coming out of Dr. Yari Lakunin's lab is that dur duration in the sauna seemed to matter with respect to robustness of, um, of the results. So I mentioned, for example, you know, people that use the sauna four to seven times a week were 50% less likely to, to die from like, you know, cardiovascular disease related death. Well, that number was referring to people that stayed in the sauna greater than 19 minutes. So this was about 20 minutes. So 20 minutes is this, is is the sweet spot at about 174 degree Fahrenheit. You know, humidity 10 to 20 percent. Um, people that sat in the sauna for like 11 minutes on average, their their reduction in cardiovascular disease related um, death from cardiovascular disease was like 8 percent. 8% versus 50%. Big difference there. So um, duration definitely matters uh, with respect to the sauna. So that's kind of where I started out with my my sort of, okay, what am I, what am I going to do? And then I also mentioned earlier about heat shock proteins. I'm also very interested in activating my heat shock proteins. Um, and so the, the 163 degree Fahrenheit for 30 minutes activated them by 50% over baseline levels. And so... Um, Typically what I do, my protocol is I do um, – typically when I go for my long runs, I don't, I don't do sauna after, but, I'll, but um, I do do a jacuzzi at night. So um, when I'm doing my Peloton bike, I do a lot of high-intensity interval training, you know, uh, Pelotons. And I crank the, the sauna up, you know, about an hour, an hour and a half before I'm going to get on that Peloton. And I get on the Peloton and then I go into the sauna immediately after – and I'm I'm in the sauna for and the sauna is typically around 186 degrees Fahrenheit for me when I get in there. And I stay in there anywhere between 20 and 30 minutes, depending on um prop mostly depending on how intense my workout was, uh, because I've already elevated my core body temperature from my my high intensity workout. Um and then there are times when I don't work out and I just get in the sauna. I end up staying in there longer for sure. I'm in there for 30 minutes, about 186 Fahrenheit. But I'm heat adapted. Like I, I, I can't tell you like when I first started doing this, I certainly um, did not start out doing that. Uh, so so um, definitely uh, keep that in mind. I also like to, to put hot water. So I have, um, I have my little bucket and um, I, do, I do put some hot water on the rocks. My hygrometer like – broke. Um, when I, when I was measuring it, uh, I was getting about 20 to 30% humidity. And then once I got 30%, I was like, I couldn't handle it. So I went back down to 10 to 20% humidity because it just feels so hot. So, uh, that's typically, those are my settings that I do. And, um, I like it the frequency, how, how often I do it, it really depends on what I have going on. So there are times when I'm like, you know, I'm doing it five days a week. Um, but then there's other times when I'm like twice a week, you know. So um, I, I do try to my, – my, my, you know, my baseline I try to keep is four. I try to do about four times a week. But I have been um, doing a lot of jacuzzi. So I've been doing jacuzzi at nighttime. Um, it's, it's like the only time my husband and I have to ourselves, um, you know, once, once our son goes to bed. 
And so we like to go out in the jacuzzi, look at the stars, and it's very relaxing and time spent together. But um, our jacuzzi is about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And there have been a lot of people have asked me, you know, can you get the same benefits from the sauna as you do from a hot bath? And we don't have all the empirical evidence to say that, yes, for sure. But we have quite a bit that seems to be accumulating. So a lot of the you know, heat shock proteins have been shown to be elevated with hot baths. Brain-derived neurotrophic factors increase with hot baths. Um, there's been some effects on um, depression as well and cardiovascular health. And so, you know, I, I, I might be going out on a limb here, but I would say I really think that hot baths and jacuzzis um, can have a similar effect. Now, staying in there, staying in the jacuzzi for 20 minutes with your shoulders submerged down is kind of key. And some of the hot bath studies were the same. The hot bath studies used 104 degree Fahrenheit water, and they were people were submerged from their shoulders down as well. But that's kind of my protocol that I that I follow. So you're typically using it to extend your workout. You're getting your heart rate up on the bike or or going for a run, and then your heart rate remains elevated once you get into the sauna. I do. Yeah, that is that's that's kind of my jam. I do, but there are times when I I, I get in there without without working out. But like, yeah, that's so you know sometimes it's like okay, if if I'm going to get in the sauna for twenty to thirty minutes, like I can I can hop on my Peloton and just push it for ten minutes, do a ten minute high intensity workout, um, and and just and and take you know so basically what I'm doing is I'm taking my workout to the next level. You know that's how, that's what I feel like the sauna is doing, where it's like all right, I did my workout and boom, I'm going to go to the next level. So, um, and I always go back to that cardiorespiratory fitness study where it's like better, you know, better, better than exercise alone. Yep. And you mentioned the hot bath could potentially be a replacement for the sauna. How about just a long extended hot shower for people that don't have a bath? Yeah, that's an interesting question. You do, I mean, you get a lot of steam from showers as well. So, um, you know, I do think steam showers... Um, can have some beneficial effects. I don't think it's going to be nearly anywhere near like the, the the data that I mentioned, you know, just because you're just not getting as hot when you're taking a hot shower. Like even like when you're in a hot bath, like you can get really hot. Um, you're just not getting quite as hot with with a hot shower. But I do think there can be some 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 benefits, perhaps. Um, I, I would, I would tend to go for the hot bath though. If, if you have, most people do have a bathtub. I know not everyone does. Uh, but if you do have a bathtub, I would go for the hot bath over the hot shower. Got it. And how about hydration? How do you, what's your kind of hydration protocol before and after the sauna? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, you do lose a lot of sweat in the sauna and, um, with sweat, you also can lose a lot of sodium, uh, and, and sodium is the main one, but you can also lose, you know, some other electrolytes like magnesium, potassium. So, um, I definitely try, I definitely stay hydrated and I, I switch between, um, sometimes I'll have like a green, a green juice that I make, um, uh, with like some kale, a little bit of lemon, um, some cucumber, um, or so I'm, you know, I'm getting some of the magnesium and potassium and stuff, or I'll do, um, the noon the electrolyte supplement noon, they have like a, a sugar-free version of it. Or sometimes I do, um, some keto. It's a, it's a ketone salt and it's called keto start. And, um, it has a lot of, it has like magnesium, it has potassium, it has a lot of electrolytes in it. And so I, I'll, I'll use that. In fact, I'm drinking that right now. Um, but so that's, that's typically what I do Cool. after, after the sauna, not before. Got it. And speaking of after the sauna, I know this is a whole nother discussion, but um, cold therapy, you know, do you ever get in the cold shower or do a cold plunge, jump in a frozen lake after the sauna? <laughs> I definitely don't jump in a frozen lake um, unless I'm visiting another country like Finland. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I do. So um, I, I do have a cold plunge and I also do like cold showers as well. I don't do it as frequently as I should. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of benefits to, to the cold as well. And, and in fact, a lot of these cultures that we talked about earlier, like Finland and Russia, like they, they, a, a large percentage of them go from hot and then into cold. Um, I don't go immediately into it. Um, I, because when you're, when you're under, when you're in this, in the heat, in this, like a sauna or a hot bath, vasodilation is occurring um, you're increasing your blood flow. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're getting vasodilation. 
And then the complete opposite happens when you go into a cold plunge or cold water, cold water immersion to, in some shape or form. You're, you're getting your vasoconstriction is happening. And so um, I've had I've had some scary incidents where going from one extreme directly into the other without waiting like five minutes or a few minutes, you know, where my blood pressure or something just goes really low and I just like I get super dizzy and it's a little scary. Hmm. So so um, I, th- I do think that exercising caution when going from extremes like that uh, hmm. is important. Uh, so, but I do, especially in the summertime, I like to, to run, uh, run out into the, the cold plunge, like, you know, a couple minutes after I do the sauna, after right. I like rest for a few minutes, two to five minutes. You mentioned that you're really well heat adapted to the sauna because of all your regular use. Um, for someone that's kind of building their heat tolerance up, is there a way that they can kind of tell how long is too long in the sauna? Are there any kind of signs they should be looking for like, Ooh, I should probably take a break and not push it. Yeah. I think, you know, your heart starts to really, your heart rate starts to get elevated and, you know, you, you definitely want to, to push past that point. Um, once you're heat adapted, but you know, and you start to feel uncomfortable, but you reach a point where your heart's going really fast and you just feel, you just feel really, really uncomfortable. And I think that's, that's that's the time I usually like to get out. I think people people should definitely listen to their bodies. I mean, getting out when you just experience the most slight bit of uncomfortableness, maybe not the way to go. But like you know, when you're in there, you know, like you're feeling like this is I've I've I'm, I'm getting really hot. And again, like once you hit the 20 minute mark, that's really all that's needed. You know, 20 minutes, 174 degree Fahrenheit. Um, that's what all these studies have shown have been beneficial for reducing cardiovascular disease, mortality and all cause mortality and Alzheimer's and dementia risk. So, so that's, I think a pretty good r- rule of thumb as well. I'm, um, you know, 20 minutes and you can also have a timer outside of your sauna. I used to do that. I used to have a timer clock and it's like, okay, I reached my time. Um, so, so that's also another option 